practices. And we're very happy to host uh, Jonathan Stern and the Carolina launch of Dissecting the Year. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Jonathan's lecture. Um, I've been a fan of, of Jonathan since I read his book, um, The Audible Pass, which talks about um, how our audio technology emerges from um, uh, our, our cultural history and how it shapes our, our listening itself. Um, we'll be talking about MP3s and the method of my interior. After that, we'll have um, uh, Dissecting the Ear, um, organized by Tao and Boyan. They have some pieces. Uh, they have one piece running in another room, and they'll also be talking about their work. Um, so, yeah, I'll give it All right, well, um, thanks to Takuro, Nico, and Erica. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. It's nice to meet all of you, although I can no longer see you. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, some stuff from a book I'm working on, on the MP3 format. Now, since uh, this might be the kind of environment where if you don't know what an MP3 is, you wouldn't admit it, I will tell you what they are. So forgive me for <laughs> being basic. Uh, uh, an MP3 is a kind of digital sound file. They usually contain music, but they can contain any kind of recorded sound. And the, the deal with an MP3 is that it's, a, on average, about 12% the size of the same file if it were formatted to fit on a compact disc, uh, which is, uh, that format's called a WAV file. Uh, and I'm just going to define some terms here because I'm going to be using them in the talk. So there's a thing called the encoder. The encoder is what converts audio on a compact disc to MP3 audio. So uh, there's an encoder inside iTunes, so if you slip a compact disc into your computer and rip it and put it in your, um, put it in your iTunes library, that's um, that's encoding, uh, although you can, buy, you can buy or download free standalone uh, encoders, and there's one called Lame that I'll mention later. Uh, MP3 belongs to a genre of thing called a codec, which is short for coder decoder, and it's a kind of specification for coding and decoding. So when I say the MP3 codec, I'm really talking about a set of specifications, and those specifications belong to something called MPEG-1, which is the Motion Picture Experts Group, uh, and it's the first iteration of their, um, of, their um, uh, uh, of, of their rules. They're now on MPEG-7, I think. So those are the, uh, the, sorry about that. That's a lot of terms to define. So now, the interesting part. I'm interested in that most people, when they talk about MP3s, talk about file sharing. The gimmick of my book is that it ends before file sharing starts because I'm interested in the MP3 for a completely different reason. Uh, the reason is because the MP3 does something, or MP3 encoders do something called perceptual coding. And this is, in fact, the reason that an MP3 file is 12% the size of a WAV file. Um, basically, what it does is it says, OK, we know from psychoacoustics that most of the vibrations in the air out there in the world that approach your ear that could be heard as sound are never perceived by your brain as sound. So if we can figure out which of those vibrations you're never going to hear, we can throw those out on the front end and make the file much smaller. You with me so far? So it's sort of like the you didn't need that anyway theory of audio. <laughs> right? So, um, and this works mostly through a process called masking, about which I will discuss later. Um, now, the ideas behind this approach come from a field called psychoacoustics. I lied, there are more definitions. Psychoacoustics is a study of auditory perception. And one of the interesting things about psychoacoustics is uh, it tends to separate content from form. So, for instance, people who write about the psychology of hearing or the psychology of music are often very interested in um, how particular types of sounds uh, have particular types of effects or sensibilities. Uh, psychoacousticians are not interested in content. So basically the theory, they're interested in things like frequency, bandwidth, uh, behavior of the ear. Basically they treat ears not that differently from the way that uh, engineers treat technologies. Uh, and there's a reason for that. Now, uh, if we're going to talk about the idea of perceptual coding, we have to consider 
who was doing research that led to the m p three. and i'm going to be a little bit anachronistic in this talk and refer to m p three research, although nobody the name m p three actually comes after the mpeg one ah agreement, which is in ninety ninety or ninety ninety one and the files weren't called m p three s until the mid nineteen ninety s. so i'm being anachronistic and you'll have to forgive me for that. Uh, the research for, for the format was done in several places. I'm going to talk about work that was done at the Fraunhofer Institute, uh, which is in Germany, and Bell Labs, which is, of course, in the United States. Now, there we go. Uh, every MP3 has within it the shadow of a mathematical model of the basilar membrane. That's the part of the inner ear that distinguishes tones and conveys them to the auditory nerve. In essence, what an MP3 encoder does is it analyzes the frequency spectrum of the recording and aims to give you a listening experience with the same timbre, but with the use of a smaller set of data than in the original recording. And so, uh, so here you have, uh, you know, there are millions of these kinds of pictures on the internet, and I just chose this one because it's handy. So you have your ear uh, out here. The part that we refer to as ear actually does very little. It sort of focuses the sound. Um, I suppose things would sound different if you if you got rid of it, but it basically focuses the focuses the sound, uh, which is then which is then further focused through the um, through the eardrum or tympanic membrane and small bones, and eventually it comes into the inner ear. Now this thing is normally rolled up in a snail shell shape in the cochlea, but uh, um, auditory psychologists and physiologists like to represent it unrolled because as you see it gets thinner as it goes along. Different parts of the basilar membrane are sensitive to different frequencies. Uh, and so uh, in a given sound, if you're playing a high-pitched or a low-pitched tone, it's going to stimulate a different part of the basilar membrane. And once it's stimulated, it sends a signal down the auditory nerve, which goes into different centers of your brain, and you perceive it as sound. So far, so good, right? OK. Now that I've said that, I'm going to give you I'm going to give you sort of the theses of my talk, which I will then endeavor to uh, demonstrate to you. There's a couple of interesting I don't know if they're contradictions or paradoxes or just pairs of phenomena uh, that go with the story I'm telling here. The first is um, that the MP3 is a format that 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 has achieved mass dissemination, but it's based on a kind of personalization. Now I don't mean like it's personalized to me and it's personalized to you, but it's personalized to a specific set of people and it's personalized to a sort of also, you might say, ideal person or ideal ear. The idea is that it is customized to, uh, to a fully functioning human ear. So in other words, um, if, we, if by public we mean that, pu uh, uh, if we mean available, generally available, MP3s are the most public form of music in the world today. More recordings exist in MP3 form than in any other form in the world. But this is only possible because of a model of a private listening subject that's built into the encoder. And if you're like me and work in a communication department and study communication theory, this is a very interesting twist um, on the usual, um, usually people differentiate between uh, dialogue on one hand and dissemination on, another, on the other. Dissemination is seen as broad and impersonal and dialogue is seen as intimate and personal. And this completely violates that, um, that couplet. So, uh, so we have dissemination based on personalization. Second interesting couplet is um, objectification of the subjective or quantification of the non-quantifiable. What they have done in an MP3 encoder is basically try to quantify aspects of the listening experience that are entirely subjective, and I'll show you how they do this later in the talk. Uh, um, because, of course, computers, in order to operate, have to be able to work with, num with numbers, and the results have to translate from one platform and situation to another, right? This is the whole point of an international standard like MPEG, right? It's supposed to work on any device that you put it into. So here's a quote from Alex Galloway, who wrote a very interesting book called Protocol. He says, the ultimate goal of internet protocols is totality. The virtues of the internet are robustness, contingency, interoperability, flexibility, heterogeneity, pantheism. Accept everything, no matter what the source, sender, or destination. Close quote. Right? Now that's all interesting 
and a, you know, and, and it's very much um, in, in keeping with how the MP3 works. But of course, all of this only matters uh, subjectively, and a psychoacoustic model can only be calibrated, can only be set up via subjective testing. In other words, the format relies upon the measurement of something that can only be approximated, the quality of the listening experience. Now this is all tied up in a broader project, which is to get the most out of your infrastructure. And the MP3 works on the very basic principle that infrastructural capacity can be expanded by throwing out what you can't hear on the front end. So the MP3 format and other perceptual codecs like it are designed through a hybrid process. They contain a map of the ear or the brain's masking patterns based on the available psychoacoustic research, and they're also based on a series of listening tests where subjects hear tones or music samples and compare them from one to another. Now, all this sounds very modern in some ways, but in fact, it's a very old idea. Um, and, and to understand this history, we have to look beyond the history of sound recording and music to the history of telephony. Um, so in doing this project, one of the things I was interested in is where do these people who did the, who, who built the MP3, where did they get their psychoacoustic models from? Where did they get their ideas of hearing from? Uh, where did they uh, learn to think about the ear and hearing? So I was interviewing a guy named J.J. Johnston who worked at Bell Labs in the 1980s. I'll say a little more about him later. And I asked him about his methods for research, his ideas for hearing, um, and he pulled out a pulled a book off the shelf from 1929, a book called Speech and Hearing by a man named Harvey Fletcher. Fletcher worked for Bell Labs in the 19-teens and 1920s, uh, and he led a research team that uh, eventually led, um, came up with many of the, the, the uh, facts about hearing that we still, uh, still believe today. So the normal frequency response of human ears, that was based in part on Fletcher's work. The idea of the Fletcher-Munson curve, for those of you who make sound, the idea that the frequency response of your ears changes as noises get louder. The moral of the story is always don't bring babies to rock concerts because you won't be able to hear them. But um, Fletcher, that was a joke, thank you. Thank you. So, it always takes a little bit longer when I travel, but yes, that was a joke. Um, I should pull up a Fletcher Munson curve. It, it, uh, it'll be a lot funnier. See, normally your hearing is um, it's like a bell curve, so it's most sensitive in the mid-range, which is right where a baby's cry is. But when you're when at extreme volumes, it's more like a smiley face, and so you're actually least sensitive in the in the mid-range and most sensitive in the highs and lows. And since a baby shriek is right around one kilohertz, which is right in the center of your hearing, that is why you should not bring a baby to a heavy metal concert. Okay, all right. That's not really, that wasn't in the, in the Fletcher and Munson article, that wasn't mentioned anywhere. Uh, so Fletcher, Fletcher did these studies uh, with a device called the audiometer. This is a picture from, it's not a very good looking picture because it's from speech and hearing. Uh, so uh, the uh, um, image quality wasn't quite so good. But basically an audiometer is a really early sine wave synthesizer. Usually the histories of sound synthesis go back to things like the telharmonium and the theremin. But this is a really interesting device because it synthesized pure tones at particular pitches. And those of you who've had tests for your hearing may have actually done this, right? Where they'll play a tone and they'll say, okay, raise your hand when you think you hear a tone. Raise your hand when you think you hear a tone. Or raise your hand when the tone stops. Um, do they do that here? No? Okay, well anyway, this is a very common mode of hearing testing to test the frequency response of your hearing to see, for instance, if you've had hearing damage um, from walking by too many jackhammers or riding too many buses or going to too many shows, as the case may be. Anyway, so uh, Fletcher worked for Bell Labs and did all this basic research into hearing. Why was Bell Labs interested in hearing? It wasn't to make the telephone sound prettier. Uh, when, you, when you look at the founding documents for Bell Labs from the 19-teens, it sounds like that's what they're doing. But very quickly, they start doing precisely the opposite. The question becomes, what is the minimum amount of sound we can send down the phone line and be, have the person's voice be intelligible on the other end? 
In other words, the less sound we can send down the phone line, the less bandwidth we have to use, and the more signals we can send down a single line, and therefore the money, more money we can make. This is very important for Bell in the teens and 20s because in the United States they were becoming a legally sanctioned monopoly, which means they gave up control over pricing. Well, you're a big corporation, you're trying to make profits. How do you make more money if you can't control prices? Well, one of the things to do is expand the capacity of your infrastructure so that that coil of wire that you've already set in place can carry, I don't know, 20 phone calls instead of 10 using the same, um, using the same uh, amount of bandwidth. So uh, that's, what, that's what Fletcher and his, his people were doing, is they were basically designing uh, ways to get more signal into the same bandwidth, and they were doing it by studying the properties of the human ear. Um, and out of this uh, research comes modern psychoacoustics and also another field called cybernetics that's very important to the history of computing. So, um, uh, I don't want to say anything about that. Well, I guess there's one thing I should say for those of you, for the um, uh, more academically inclined in the audience. Um, this is, what I'm talking about here is a form of biopower. Um, biopower is, uh, occurs when modern institutions bring life and its mechanisms into the realm of explicit calculations. That's a quote from the philosopher Michel Foucault. Now Foucault wasn't writing about capitalism and factories and industry, but that's exactly what's happening here, is bodies, in other words, telephone users' ears and, and minds are basically being used to expand the capacity of infrastructure, in this case, to generate value for Bell. It works a little differently with MP3s. And so already we can see some of the public-private scenario I was talking about above. Uh, precisely at the time that AT&T becomes a utility in the United States and starts its ad campaigns around universal service, users' bodies become integral parts of the infrastructure. Now, psychoacoustics, uh, one of the things that they were very interested in was a phenomenon called masking. Masking went with uh, noise as something to be studied because uh, it's about where the ear breaks down, where you can't hear things. Um, masking was known since, 19, since 1878, um, but it was Harvey Fletcher in the 1940s who established um, the idea of critical bands, and I'm actually going to do this backwards. So basically, a critical band is the idea that your basilar membrane, remember that stretched out thing I showed you in the, in the, in the first slide with the ear, has certain bands on it. And whenever a, a, a particular band is stimulated with a sound, if a second sound that's not as loud comes in, you just won't hear it. It's like it, if this is totally not a correct metaphor, but it gets the point across. It's like getting a busy signal, right? So the band's in use, second sound comes in, and, uh, and uh, the, ear, the ear doesn't hear it. So uh, it works, and you can sort of see it here. So we have volume curves, normal threshold of quiet. In other words, you need X number of decibels at these frequencies in order to hear a sound. Now, if you play a tone, and this is at, I don't know, 250 cycles a second, uh, it creates a threshold here below which nothing will be audible. So if you play a second sound at... Uh, I don't know, 450 hertz, you won't hear it. So, you say, well, that's all very interesting hypothetically, but how does it work? I can give you a demonstration. So, I'm going to play you two sets of two recordings. First, for, and, and, and recordings one and two and three, four, three and four, both have the same amount of energy. So this is just going to take, this is, this is very quick. Uh, so first you're going to hear what sounds like a single sine wave, and then you're going to hear what sounds like three tones together. What's interesting is if you listen to the first and second together, what you'll hear is that the, the tone that continues between the two sounds like it has the same volume, and then the other two tones that come in in the second one make it sound like it's louder. But what's actually happening, there, it's the same exact amount of energy in the recording. What's happening is um, they, they spread the sound out over three critical bands instead of one. So in the first you'll hear, um, you'll hear well, here, I'm just going to play it, all right? So this is one, getting used to it for a second, 
Now, here's two. Now I'll do it with a broadband and narrowband noise. Again, same amount of energy in the two recordings, the first one you hear and the second one you hear. The difference is one will be all concentrated in a single critical band, and the second will be spread out across critical bands, and so the second one should sound louder. Whoops. Here we go. I'll turn that up. So get used to it. Sounds louder. Same exact amount of energy in the recording. That is the masking function of the ear at work. You with me so far? All right, so it's like optical illusions, but with your ears. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, now, historically, masking was seen as a problem. Until the 1970s, masking was something that uh, communications engineers and sound researchers thought we should try to get rid of because it gets in the way of things. Um, that changed in the 1970s. AT&T became interested in the digital coding of speech for reassembly at the other end. And this was, in the 70s, the same, the same basic issue they were confronting in the 1910s. If you could transmit the speech digitally and reassemble it at the other end, you could use much less bandwidth and therefore make more money out of your infrastructure. And actually, this is what cell phones do, is they decompile your speech and recompile it at the other end. Also, uh, voice over IP like Skype or any of those, uh, those other um, uh, networking technologies, same principle. They, they decompile your speech and then recompile it at the other end is digital code. Now, the problem with digitization was that it introduced unacceptable amounts of noise, which masked the voice. We all know what masking is now, so I can say that. Researchers tried to get rid of both until a series of experiments at Bell Labs by three guys uh, named Schroeder, Hall, and Atal in the 1970s. And they said, hey, actually what you can do is use the masking properties of the human ear to hide the noise under audible speech. And they published a paper in 1977, which is still widely cited. Now, the reason they were able to do this is because they actually took, um, they hired a couple of people, Joe Hall and another guy, um, to start work on what they called cochlear modeling, where they started not only looking at these, whoops, where did it go? Not only looking at these critical bands, but also actually trying to model the behavior of the basilar membrane, because it's not quite cut and dry as these bands would make it out to seem. Um, so the same year that that article came out in 1977, a German professor named Dieter Seitzer applied for and was denied funding for a research project in the digital transmission of music over phone lines, again, using masking properties. By the 1980s, you have groups uh, all over Europe interested in digital radio broadcasting. And once you have the spread of the internet in, in um, the late 80s and early 90s, the, the desire increases even more for standards that are somehow interchangeable. So masking moves from being a problem to a potential solution for dealing with noise and also making audio files smaller. Now, of course, the other thing you need in order for this to work out is computing power. Uh, computers simply couldn't do the kinds of calculations that you need to encode an MP3 in the before the 1980s. So J.J. Johnston, whom I introduced before, uh, tells a story that he would write perceptual codecs just to test the new supercomputer at Bell Labs in the 80s. And even there, he said it was slow work. And he actually tells this really long story of like hooking up his record player to his tape deck, recording something on the tape deck, taking the tape deck into Bell Labs, and then running it through three different devices to actually get it onto the computer in order to, uh, in order to um, uh, create a digital sound file, because there weren't CDs at this point. And in fact, he says, there were no CDs at this point. It took about two hours to get 10 seconds worth of music. Fraunhofer, meanwhile, was struggling along with equipment closer to consumer grade, and their processing took overnight. 
So even in, even in the 80s, we're talking about very slow going, and it was seen as cutting edge research. Of course, now if you walk into the computer engineering department at McGill, they all say, oh, audio is boring, it's so easy. So uh, that's, I guess, a measure of how things change. The other thing that changes is attitudes towards computers. And I have a quote here from my colleague, Georgina Bourne. Now, she was writing about ERCAM in, in uh, Paris, but it's actually quite a similar story here. There's been a development, she says, from music analysis as a purely analytic field to one that, employing the computer in conjunction with the rise of cognitive music studies and AI, aims to provide both computer analysis of musical structure and also computerized models of music knowledge or rules as aids to composition. The computer has therefore come to be seen as a tool for analyzing the deep structures or cognitive rules characteristic of certain musics, but equally for simulating these rules and indeed for generating entirely new abstract structures as frameworks for composition. In other words, computers in people's minds went from just modeling devices to devices that could actually generate and, and transmogrify sound in one way or another using rules derived from psychoacoustics. So even though the goals of the ERCAM composers were different from our MP3 engineers, they're working in the same period and they're working with the same set of ideas. So let's talk about how this masking thing works. All right, so this just is straight off the internet. This diagram is from Fraunhofer's website. Fraunhofer owns many of the important patents for MP3s. If you want to build something with an MP3 encoder in it, you have to pay them royalties, although there's actually this big lawsuit about it in the United States right now. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to explain this whole diagram unless people are really curious. But basically, what you need to know is, so here, this is all metaphorical. It isn't exactly how it works. But you have your, your recording coming in here. right? It goes through all this stuff and comes out here as an MP3. There's two sets of important operations going on. At this level, what's happening is the perceptual model, which is the mathematical model of the, of the critical bands and psychoacoustics, um, are being applied to the music. In other words, it analyzes the frequency structure of the sound coming in and says, aha, this is, all this stuff is concentrated in one critical band. You're not going to hear it anyway. We're going to throw it out. So that's the first part. And then in the second part, um, they uh, deal with the noise that's introduced by the process. And also, uh, they, they deal with the, um, how, how much you want to crunch down your file, right? Because if those of you who've encoded MP3s know that you can decide how big the file is. And the smaller the file is, the more the um, encoder has to throw out. Now, this sounds simple in theory, um, but it turns out that the uh, measurements in psychoacoustics textbooks weren't up to the test. So here's Karl Heinz Brandenburg, who worked at Fraunhofer. Uh, he says, I literally took Eberhard Zwicker's book, Psychoacoustics, and read through it and built some of the rules into the psychoacoustic model. J.J. Johnston borrowed some data from Harvey Fletcher and more from Joe Hall, one of the authors of that 19... 77 paper that said you could hide noise with masking. But the problem was, it didn't quite work. Um, it only got them part of the way there. And that has to do with what psychoacoustic research was interested in up to the moment that people started doing perceptual coding research. Um, two of the big issues with MP3 encoding, and they were big issues early on, and they're still big issues today, are um, stereo depth, sort of how the stereo field sounds, and also something called pre-echo, uh, which has to do with, um, with um, percussion. And I will, I will give you examples of these a little later on. Uh, psycho, uh, psychoacoustic research at the time had mostly been conducted with things like pure tones to test hearing, to create measurements of frequency responses, and so on and so forth. Not much work had been done with music. And in fact, some of the aspects of psychoacoustic research had to be rethought in order to, um, in order to analyze music. So the solution to all this was not just importing uh, data from, from uh, previous psychoacoustic research, but doing some of their own uh, through what were called subjective listening tests. Now, when you do tests like these, there are two key issues. 
Um, the first is how do you weigh the subjective versus the objective? In other words, people saying, I can hear a difference, I know there's a difference, versus results you get in the laboratory, right? Um, and this is true for those of you who know audio files, right? There's this huge argument about whether um, it's, you, you know a piece of equipment by doing a double blind test in like a perfectly treated room, or whether you only really know something after you live with it in your living room for many months, right? So testing conditions are kind of artificial, and what happens over time in the real world can be quite an issue. Uh, and people in science and technology studies actually talk about this with respect to, for instance, the space shuttle crash, where O-rings that work perfectly in testing situations didn't work uh, when, the, um, uh, when, when, when the shuttle actually took off. Um, I'm going to come back to that. Uh, so the International Telecommunications Union, and I'm not going to read this long quote because it's pretty dry, but basically they hedge their bets. They say, look, uh, you know, we know that testing is an artificial condition, but what we're trying to do is create a worst case scenario for audio. So what's the worst case scenario for audio? Really carefully well-trained listeners, what they call expert listeners. And interestingly, well, there's some disagreement about this. There are people who believe that expert listeners uh, should be audiophiles, sound engineers, musicians, people with golden ears, people who really know music, but there are other people in the field who will say, well, actually the um, expert listener is just anybody who's been trained to, um, to uh, understand what artifacts of MP3 compression sound like. And so as long as they can identify those artifacts and say, hey, that's wrong, that'll be fine. And that's sort of the... Uh, that's actually very close to the model. I had a friend who worked for Frito-Lay, which is a potato chip company, and his job was to taste the potato chips. And it wasn't whether the chips were good or not. It was, here's your, here's your chip that all the other chips are supposed to taste like. And then he gets a bunch of other chips, and oh, that one's too salty, that one's not salty enough, that one doesn't have enough of the whatever artificial ingredient gives you vinegar flavor, and so on and so forth. So basically an expert listener is the same kind of principle. Uh, so the point, of, the point of all this is that if worst case scenario, if the worst case scenario hypothesis work, it should work in the real world even if real world, world conditions are different. So how does this test work? I'm going to give you a very truncated version of this test. But if we were doing this in, in a lab, we would probably select 12 recordings. Now, the, the, the recordings would all be the same recording. So it would be the same song recorded by the same band with the same instruments. It would be just different versions of the same recording. The first would be, and you would know what this one is, it would be the version that's on the CD, the WAV file. Then there'd be 11 others. One of them would be the WAV file again. So if that's number five, and on number five you say, well, actually that one sounds much worse than the original, <laughs> you've broken the test. Uh, another one would be simply band limited. In other words, they would just run a filter through it. Uh, and that would, that would also be to see whether you can actually hear compression artifacts. And then the rest of them would have various kinds of compression artifacts, and the goal would be to test uh, the compression. So can you hear the difference between the two? Now here we get into all those testing conditions. Um, some, people, uh, some people say that they can always tell the difference between an MP3 and a WAV file and the MP3 really annoys them. But in tests, actually what they found is it is very, very, very difficult <laughs> to distinguish between a 256 kilobit per second MP3 and a WAV file in laboratory conditions. It's just very, very difficult for people. In fact, to untrained listeners, it's often very difficult to distinguish between a 128 kilobit per second MP3 and a, um, uh, a WAV file. So MP3 encoders in some ways may or may not live up to may or may not live up to their testing conditions, but in a way they don't have to, right? Because the lab it's like sound treated, you've got people listening very intently. But then think about how people actually listen to MP3s. They walk around with these things in traffic with earbuds on, 
which is probably not the safest thing in the world. Uh, they listen to it on trains, on airplanes, they listen to it on tiny computer speakers. All of these scenarios are imperfect conditions where actually the differences between the MP3 and the WAV file are even more difficult to apprehend. Right? So ultimately, we could say private experience is quantified twice. Once in the test itself, um, and Louis Thibault, who helped write the standard from which I take this quote, says, we treat people as meters. As harsh as it may seem, we have a very scientific approach to sound testing. Uh, and in another place he says, we sort of view the listeners as the extension of the sound reproduction equipment. Um, so that's one place where private experience is quantified. The second place is when an engineer takes the test results and says, okay, now we've got to edit our encoder. So the expert listener's experience becomes part of the numerical sequence that represents the basilar membrane in the MP3 encoder. Now, all of this is particularly important because the psychoacoustic model is perhaps the most valuable part of the MP3 format. In the original MPEG specification, which is not particularly fun reading, but I recommend it if you're interested in this stuff, uh, there's a model called Model 2 that was originally given and used for MP3 encoding, although nobody uses that model anymore. Um, and so changes to the psychoacoustic model combined with other refinements mean that an encoder like Lane can make a different sounding MP3 at the same bit rate um, from an encoder in iTunes. And a lot of people say they think Lane MP3s sound better than iTunes MP3s. So even though the psychoacoustic model is perhaps the defining technological element of the MP3 format, it's also sort of the blank that needs to be filled in every time a new encoder is built. And there's one thing I forgot to show you, but this is actually my favorite slide because even though it's about audio, it can be applied to anything. Um, <laughs> so what you have here is, is a scale. And this actually really illustrates the difference between psychoacoustic testing, say, in 1930 and psychoacoustic testing in 1988 or 91 or today. Um, in the 30s, when they were developing the data that led to Fletcher's famous articles on, on, on masking, they, they had a, a range of effects from a sound being imperceptible, and the scale went all the way up to painful. So in other words, psychoacousticians were interested in the threshold of pain. They were interested in tones having an effect being perceptible. Here we're talking about music, which is an aesthetic experience. So the question is, is the encoding imperceptible? Can you not tell the difference? Is it perceptible, but not annoying? Is it slightly annoying, annoying, or very annoying? Right? And I recommend that you find ways to use this scale in your everyday life. But uh, the, the, the point being, this is an aesthetic scale. And it's incredibly subjective, even though they have these numbers here. Right? So you say, well, I give that one about a negative 2.3 in comparison with the, uh, with the original recording. You're saying, I'm finding those things very annoying. And by quantifying it, by giving it a number, it becomes comparable with other people's results in the experiments. And that's, why, that's how, then, engineers who are interested in um, coming up with new psychoacoustic models or testing ones that they've come up with um, can calibrate people's experiences to one another. So I'll give you a conclusion, then we'll do the listening test, then we'll do discussion. Although there are multiple psychoacoustic models running around out there, all perceptually coded formats, whether we're talking MP3, AAC, Og Vorbis, contain within them a model of li the listening subject. And this model is what makes the format work and enables its wide distribution, even as it's also the thing that remains doubly private. It's privately held by the companies that make the encoders, and it's private in the sense that it's part of the code which calibrates a format for mass distribution to the private experience, of, at least of its test listeners, and in theory, of its all of its listeners. So an MP3 is based on, at once, a collective and structured imagination of listening and the inner life of hearing, or the ear, um, and the combination of two historical trajectories that we usually don't think about together, which are telephony and music. So the MP3 is a contemporary instantiation of AT&T's biopolitical model for distribution. The user's body upholds and lubricates the infrastructure for mass transmission and dissemination. Though, of course, it's different in the MP3 case because it's not generating value for a single company the way it worked in um, 
in AT&T. And in fact, there are many people who argue that it's precisely doing the opposite and undermining uh, the production of value. And so, um, and this is my, this is my pointy-headed academic conclusion. This contradicts some of the standard pieties of communication theory. The mass dissemination of sound files is not based on intersubjectivity, collectivity, or even impersonality, but instead on a radical sub-individuation of listening. So that's the end of the talk, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing you right if we didn't do an MP3 listening test to see if you can tell the difference <laughs> between MP3s and WAV files. So would you like to do the easy one first or the hard one first? Oh, awesome, awesome. That was right. a joke. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, if you're joking, then I guess you start with the easy one. Okay. So the, this is um, okay. So you're gonna hear you're gonna hear four recordings. This is like the 12 one, but it's only four. Uh, the the first one is gonna be the WAV file, CD version, and then there's gonna be three others. One of them will be the WAV file again. One of them will be 128 kilobit per second MP3, which is what uh, sort of the default MP3 that you would get if you just put a CD in iTunes without customizing it in any way. And then 192 kilobit per second MP3, which sounds slightly better. What you're going to hear is a recording of castanets, and this is the easy one in the sense that it's, um, it's the one that still breaks the encoder. And I should say that all of these um, MP3s were made with iTunes, so I just used the cheapest, um, least special thing available to me to make them, uh, so that it was sort of like a real world test. So here we have some castanets. I hope. That's the wave file. Now you've got three others. So this is one. Here's two. Okay, so how many think one is the 128 kilobit per second MP3? That would be the worst sounding file. How many think two is the 128 kilobit MP3? Raise those hands high. All right, and how many think three is the 128 kilobit per M second MP3? All right, so, uh, and then how many People think one is the WAV file. Raise those hands high. I can't see them. You're hedging your bets. All right. How many people think two is the WAV file? All right. And how many say three is the WAV file? All right. Brave souls, one and all. So one was the WAV file. <laughs> two is the 128 kilobit per second MP3, and three was the 192 kilobit per second MP3. Now that's e now that's an easy one. I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you what to listen for. Now I'm not saying that I could do this blindfolded either. I'm just holding the, the man holding the iPod. <laughs> I'm not saying I could do this blindfolded either, but uh, I'm going to play you the 128 kilobit per second one, and you can listen for a couple of things. One is that the stereo field, when it echoes out after it stops hitting, it gets narrower quicker. Uh, it doesn't have the same depth. And the other thing you can hear is, so there's that real clicking, right? 
There's a phenomenon called pre-echo, which drives some people crazy and other people can't hear it. But it's this little bit of swishing <laughs> right before the percussive sound of the castanet. So I'm going to play you the 128 kilobit per second one. Could you turn it up just a little bit? Um, and, and so you can listen for that effect. And we'll, we'll try it. It's just lacking a little bit of the crispness that you hear here. So you can hear it here now that I've sort of pointed it out to you. But of course, on, on, when, you're taking, when you're taking the train to the airport, probably not so much. So we'll do, we'll do, should we do one more hard one? To questions? Okay, I'll stop. All right. We can do that later. <laughs> so, questions, comments, discussion. I can say more about the book too. I sort of forgot to give you this sort of broader map of the book, but I've been going on for a while. So, Well, okay, I have several central theses in the book. Um, one is that there's no such thing as the bare life of hearing separate from communication technology. So the book is basically set up where first we do this proximal history of the MP3 format, and I sort of say, here's how it was actually put together, and here was the thinking behind it. But then I say, to understand that, you have to go back and look at the longer history of psychoacoustics over the course of the 20th century. And quickly, what is revealed through this exercise is that everything we think we know about hearing in itself is actually based on the encounter between ears and sound reproduction technologies, especially telephony, but sound synthesis in general. And so, um, and so what we think we have, uh, what we think we know now about human nature is actually very much a story about life with uh, life in a mediated or media suffused. Culture. So that's the closest thing I have to a thesis. Um, uh, yeah. So the the like I said, the, the gimmick of the book is that it's not about file sharing. It's about it's really a history of percep the idea of perceptual coding and its practice. And so I look at um, lab. I, I look at I look at published research, and also I, I wound up going to interview people because. Actually, the question that drove me to start talking to these engineers was, nowhere, nowhere could I find out where they got their psychoacoustic models from. They just said, oh, well, we have the psychoacoustic model, so we're going to apply it this way. And so I had to go and ask them. And that's where I got that wonderful quote about, well, I was just reading Zwicker's textbook, and so I thought I'd input that into the code and see how that worked. And so there was this direct line of descent from sort of telephone um, and tape recorder research to, uh, to MP3 research. I mean, and I guess that's the other thing is it's another, I mean, there's probably hundreds of these studies now, but it's another one of those studies that sort of says all this stuff that we think is so new with digital media actually has a much longer history. And it's not accidental that it's with the phone company because, of course, the phone company uh, developed a lot of the ideas that were really important for digitization. And in fact, you can find articles from 1912 that talk about digital communication. They just mean telegraphs, because of course telegraphs are either the circuit's closed or it's open, right? So in that sense, it's binary. It's just not normally thought of in the same way. So that's the short version of the book. Um, but I can, I can go on from there. Yeah. Another question, yes. Actually, at, at the moment, uh, a different movement is also happening, and that is um, enlarging the amount of information for sound, like in uh, making the sample rate higher, uh -huh. 192 or right. whatever. And we also uh, discuss this in, in the book in relation to MP3? Uh, no, actually, because um, I see them as not entirely. They're. they're, they're they're not entirely related. Um, I sort of see that as a different uh, set of issues. For one, what's interesting about the MP3 format to me is that it's a complete refusal of the normal speci engineering specifications um, that are used to discuss equipment, right? So you go into the store, and there's a pair of headphones. And you flip it over on the back, and you've got 
you've got dynamic range, right? It's, it, it can, can handle, you know, so you can hear a pin, theoretically you can hear a pin drop and a jet plane taking off with these headphones, right? And then you've got frequency response, 20, 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. What's interesting about the MP3 research is that the people doing this work basically abandoned all of those signal processing um, metaphors because they said actually the ear doesn't process signal in the same way that equipment does. So sure, we want equipment that theoretically can reproduce the whole range of sounds, but even if we have that, the ear may not be able to perceive it. And so we're interested in the perception side of it. And so that's the story I'm telling here. Um, and the quest for, for higher resolution, I mean, uh, you talk to audio engineers, there's actually a great deal of disagreement over whether 192 kilohertz is an audi audible improvement over 96 kilohertz and whether it's worth all the money that it would cost to update, you know, if you're in a professional studio, whether it's worth all the money it would cost to update your Pro Tools rig to be able to, uh, to, uh, to move, that, move that amount of data. So, um, so yeah, I'm really, I'm really interested in the history of compression because I think the other, the other history is a little bit more out there and we're used to hearing stories about prog progress and fidelity. Things are sounding better. They're getting more like reality, which is actually not true at all and has never been true. It's Michel Chion who does, uh, who, who's uh, written a bunch of, of great books on, on sound for film. Uh, has a line where he says, it's really not about fidelity, it's about definition. If you're in a room talking to somebody and they're facing away from you, the top end of their voice totally disappears. But in a movie, you want that sort of crisp, uh, clear high end that comes with it. And that's what people are actually interested in with sound reproduction, is they're interested in sort of various kinds of definition. But even there, we're talking about an aesthetic and not an absolute. Right, because we know every medium sort of has its sound, whether we're talking about tape or digital or whatever. So, good question. <laughs> oh, oh, I see a hand. No, no, no. I don't know if it's a question, but I have the impression, so means that um, the criticism before you came with this talk is sort of that MP3 is, uh, is a loss, a loss of, uh, of sound and whatever. Mm -hmm. And you, your take on it is sort of saying, yeah, but we, we, didn't, we didn't need all these uh, uh, resonances or whatever that's taken out anyway, so it doesn't matter. So that's sort of what I understand from, from what, what you say, right? Well, it's, I, I don't know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, oh, okay, you know, I wouldn't walk into a professional studio and say, okay, just do everything in MP3, that's all right. <laughs> um, right, just like university professors like me have to believe in the supremacy of grammar, even if it's completely irrelevant for text messaging, um, I would want professional recording engineers to believe in the importance of sound quality and maximum, uh, maximum definition in a recording or most interesting distortion or whatever effect they're going after. So I wouldn't, in an absolute sense, say that's the case. But uh, but people who, for instance, will say listening pleasure decreases with uh, with levels of fidelity or definition, I would question that quite seriously, because I don't think there's much historical or cross-cultural evidence for that. And I would also say that if you're like obsessively worried about the difference between MP3. And, and CD quality in your own listening environments, you know, the questions I would ask, well, is your room treated? What kind of speakers are you using? Are you paying full attention? Because if you're not, those differences quickly become imperceptible. So it's also, um, it's, it, it's, 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 it's about that. So it's really a question of where you're having the, the argument. But sound quality is actually a much more complex thing than we normally let on. And that's one of the things that's so interesting about both perceptual coding and the fact that you can hear my booming voice over the telephone, even though it transmits no low frequencies at all and your brain is just resynthesizing them. So. No, the reason why I'm asking is because I'm actually very interested in this idea of masking also from psychoacoustics. Uh -huh. um, I think my thesis would be that listening is sort of a striving of auditory distress. That's auditory distress that can also be very pleasurable, but in a sense, uh, our modes of listening are sort of triggered or uh, we have developed these modes over time to mask the, 
the levels of auditory distress sort of denote just to, uh, to keep control over our auditory space. Now, um, in recordings or in theater or whatever, there are also uh, strategies that, uh, that channel that auditory distress through, through a listening perspective. So that's sort of the difference between me having my mode of, uh, of listening and the object having a perspective. Uh, giving us perspective. Now, MP3 seems to give a listening perspective as it applies all this uh, psychoacoustic uh, knowledge. But then there's something for me, I don't know, maybe sad because it's sort of taking away the pleasure of me, it's sort of giving me already how I should listen to it, giving my, sort of the mode of listening in it, uh, inscribed in it much more than than in, in yeah, whatever kind of uh, recording. So maybe that's, I don't want to be the, pure, the sound purist here, but <laughs> no, it, it is based on strongly normative ideas exactly, of how people yeah. do listen yeah. and how they should listen, and, should and listen. that's fascinating. But you know, but so is so is a compact disc or anything else. Right, but then so. <laughs> as I was listening to it now, to, to the, the different the samples, then the, the, maybe you could say that MP3 is, is exactly recreating all its very distress in a different way, mm -hmm. because it's again a sound material and it's it's a little bit less or it's a little bit different from the original. But it, it's, it, you know, it, it doesn't do away with the fact that auditory distress can, can be created. But that's not a question. <laughs> it's okay. Comments are fine. I, I, talk. You I didn't ask you questions. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. But do you follow me on this or is this yeah. completely out of the... Yeah, room? no, no, no. I think you're totally right that, yeah. that part of the deal with MP3 is saying, okay, we're going to expect that you listen in a certain way. And so we're going to basically encode that in. Yeah. And what's interesting is it encodes the way most people do, in fact, listen to music today. At least in, in you know, modern urban, uh, modern urban, stereotypically modern urban life. I don't want to say everybody behaves the same way or anything, but you know, uh, music is generally listened to in a state of distraction. It is generally listened to in non-perfect. Uh, acoustic environments, right? It sort of follows the rules, but when you start breaking those rules, that's when MP3 gets. Uh, that's when <laughs> we'll sample that. Um, uh, that's when MP3 gets more um, gets more complicated and more vexed of a thing. Like when I sit here and say, "Okay, listen for this artifact," and then you hear the artifact. And now you're going to go home and check all your recordings on your computer and you say, aha, I hear the pre-echo. That's too swooshy. That's driving me crazy. I need to go back and get the WAV file. Thing. Or you'll be like, I couldn't hear it in the talk and I don't care and can I please listen to the music now? So, so no, I think that's a very, the normative dimension is really, really important. Yeah, so, yeah, so this is a remark. I think that the way you you say that it's, it's rather sad that the normal way of listening is in, in and you say the distraction is in a low quality of environment. So I think that sound quality is also a matter of aesthetics and even ethics maybe. So, just as I agree. Answer, so that's, that's yeah, no, it's absolutely a matter of aesthetics. And actually, I will, since I have a bunch of people who are interested in sound art, I will, I often get the question, you know, are there people working with compression artifacts in their art? And I never have a good answer. I mean, I know people struggle with how much do I compress this or that or the other thing. But if any of you know of uh, sound art that actually works with compression artifacts, I would be interested in hearing about it and or hearing it. All right, thank you very much.